All right, now let's take a look at histograms. All right, let's see what the definition of a histogram is. Your book says that a histogram is a graph consisting of bars of equal width drawn adjacent to each other unless there are gaps in the data. The horizontal scale, horizontal that's left to right, it's like your x-axis, the horizontal scale represents classes of quantitative data values and the vertical scale represents frequencies. The horizontal is like the x-axis and the vertical is like the y-axis. So the vertical scale will be like the y. It represents frequencies. The heights of the bars correspond to the frequency values. So you still have to have those frequency values. You still have to, if you have a set of data, you still have to be able to write them in some type of frequency distribution so that you can draw a histogram. Let me show you an example of a histogram. So this is the same set of data that we looked at uh, that was on low, the low lead group of children. All right, we had this va these values. All this was in a frequency distribution. Okay, now notice these numbers here on the bottom at each at each point or each tick mark on the x-axis. Does anybody remember what those were called? The class boundaries, right? I believe that was the class boundaries. Let's go back. We can go back. Yeah, no. The gap between them. Okay. So, we're to go back where we first went over class boundaries. Remember, we looked at this chart here. And we said that number between the two classes. And notice this first here. There's not e there's not two classes. There's just that one lower limit. You start off at 49.5. So. This histogram, notice where it starts off on the x-axis, 49.5. Then this is the next class boundary, the next class boundary, and so on and so forth. Notice there's no gap between this data set and the next data set, or I'm sorry, this class and the next class because there was no gap in the data whenever we wrote the frequency distribution. All right, so there's no gap here. That's how a histogram is a little different from just a regular bar graph. It, there's no gap. Then the height of each bar depends on the frequency of the class. Since this bar represents one class and there was only two in this first class, you can see it's only one-fifth of the way up to ten. Okay, The next bar there were 33 in the second class. So that means this bar graph better be around 30, where 33 would be. And if you go to the top of this bar and you go over, that's about a third of the way up to 40. So that's probably around 33. The next class, I believe, had 35. You see it's just a little bit taller, so it should be halfway between 30 and 40. The next class must have had around 8, 7, or 8. As you can see, if you trace this over, that's where it will be. And then the last class, it looks like it was smaller than the first class. So in the last class, we must have only had one. You can see that's half of that one. So, yeah, there's only one. So that is a histogram. A relative frequency histogram. Remember, the only difference with relative frequency distribution was that we, instead of having the number, we had a percentage. And so this relative frequency histogram, the x-axis, all this, that's still labeled the same. Along the y-axis, instead of having just the frequency, we have the percentage. So we would need to look at the relative frequency distribution to be able to graph the relative frequency histogram. We've got to know these percentages. And then on the y-axis, and again, instead of the, the frequency, the number, like, like the previous histogram, we have the percentage in each class.
Now, you remember we went over normal distribution of a relative frequency? So we start out with low numbers, then we get, then it goes high numbers, and then we go back down to low numbers. And we said it kind of looked, it was bell shaped, but I never showed you what bell shape mean. Well, look at this. Start out with low numbers, then go up to high numbers, and then back down to low numbers. That's bell shaped. That's what that means. Every bell really don't look like that, but you know, you could imagine that, that a bell could, the outline of a bell would kind of look like that in two dimensions. All right. Common distributions. Here's the bell shape curve, or the bell shape distribution, which we call a normal distribution. Here's a uniform distribution. It's not that it, they're all at the top. They're uniform because they're all around the same height. So, you know, if all these were around 400, that's still uniform. It's that every bar in our histogram is around the same value. Now look at this. Skewed to the right, skewed to the left. So, probably just the opposite of what you would think, right? Skewed to the right, more smaller values, or, or I guess a less frequency with the larger numbers on the right makes the graph skewed to the right. Uh, a smaller frequency of the values on the left makes the distribution or the histogram skewed to the left. Even though it's to the right side, it's skewed to the left. Even though this one is to the left side, it's skewed to the right. So you can think about the skewness kind of like the opposite of what you would think. Okay. Notice if we if we were to, to look at this on the right side, it's kind of like it makes it makes what your book calls a tail. The right tail of this bell curve is longer or larger. So that means it's skewed to the right. The left tail of this histogram is larger, so it's skewed to the left. All right. And then we could um, plot the values. This right here, criteria for assessing normality with a normal quantile plot normal distribution. Don't believe you'll have to worry about this on the test. I'm just going to read through it real quick. The population is normal if the pattern of the points in the normal quantile plot is reasonably close to a straight line. The points do not show some systematic pattern that is not a straight line. Okay. Um, so you see that it's kind of a if you were to plot all these these points, these normal quantile points. It's not that if you connected the dots you would have a straight line, it's just that if you drew a straight line in between all the values, then all the, the plots are around that straight line. Okay? If, and then your book goes on to say, not a normal distribution. The population distribution is not normal if the normal quantile plot has either or both of these two conditions. The points do not lie reasonably close to a straight line the points show some systematic pattern that is not a straight line pattern. So I'm pretty sure if we scroll down a little bit. So this above here, this is a normal distribution. That goes with this. This down here, look at all these values here. They're not all around this line here. Yeah, these up here are, but all these are not. All these down here. So that's, that's not a normal distribution. Then here's another example. This right here, it says it's not a normal distribution because the points show a systematic pattern that is not a straight line pattern. If I was to take and just look at this graph, you say, well, that's about the same. Well, look at this. If you, if you connect the dots, look what it forms. It forms smooth curves, doesn't it? If you can form smooth curves like that, then it's also not a normal distribution. And it wasn't with that, it was with this text here. The points show a systematic pattern that is not a straight line. 